<laughs> We're all good. Hi guys, welcome. It's the first episode of Introduction to Astronomy since the lockdown days. So thanks for coming along and welcome. Uh, let's get this underway. So tonight's talk is titled Nuclear Synthesis, How and Where the Elements Are Made. Nuclear synthesis refers to the making of new atoms and elements. And tonight we're going to talk into some detail about how and where the elements are made. Now, some of you might be thinking, didn't we have a talk on this in February? This is part of my stellar series that I've, we've been working on the last couple of years, and this topic was designed for the end of that series. And Peter Fellhofer kindly covered me in February, and he did nuclear synthesis. But it's, it's an interesting and a, and a wide topic, whereby you can approach it from all different angles. And his talk was brilliant. It was also brilliant because I thought, yeah, that he, he approached it from one angle, so I'm going to complement or supplement that and approach the topic from another angle, so hopefully things will come together and be a lot clearer. And if you didn't see uh, his talk in February, um, you'll be able to see it online. <coughs> it's just at the uh, AAS YouTube site. So a little bit of introduction about what elements are and a definition and so on. You often probably have seen that before or heard it. Everything is made of elements and everything is made of atoms. Well, 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 what's that? What's all the difference? What's going on here? Well, the bottom line is they're both saying the same thing. Elements are essentially atoms that are defined by the number of protons in their central nucleus and their subsequent chemical properties because of that. And that's the key to it all. Every element is just an atom, but you define them by the number of proteins in their nucleus. That's the key to it all. Elements are, are then are made, there's a number of processes that go on in the universe that make elements. That's what we're going to do. But also it allows you to make a periodic table of elements color-coded by the origins of the elements. And you'll see that in your hand out there. And that's what it should look like. So here's your the standard periodic table, all the elements are all in the usual spots according to their chemical properties and so on. I'm sure you've seen that a zillion times in high school. But this time, what they've done is color-coded the elements with the origins, the process, the me mechanisms that created these elements. For example, dying low-mass stars, which we'll talk about. There they are in green and so on. So that then raises the question, okay, so that's the origin of these different elements, what different mechanisms are involved in each process, and that's where we're going to focus on tonight. So I'm going to do this by breaking the talk into six chapters, talk a little bit of background, we'll just briefly touch upon just some high school reminiscing of the atom, just capping what it is, just re refreshing ourselves what nuclear fusion means, and here's a topic that often doesn't get raised when you're talking about nuclear synthesis, the making of elements. Hello, radioactivity, nuclear de decay, isn't that pulling things apart? I will show you tonight how that is an essential part of nuclear synthesis, is actually pulling atoms apart. We'll then talk about the Big Bang nuclear synthesis, in other words, the primordial elements, the very first elements that formed in those first early times in the universe was, came about. Stellar nuclear synthesis, we're going to talk about the processes that occur inside stars, primarily nuclear fusion and nucle neutron capture by what they call the S process. Don't be confused by all that S process. You know what the S stands for? Slow. And yet you got it. What does the R stand for? The R process, neutron capture, capture? rapid. Yep. So then there's the explosive nuclear synthesis, in other words, how the elements are made in the explosions, in particular supernovae and kilonovae. And no doubt you all saw the talk online on how to differentiate those two. Yeah, and it's in those explosions you get the R process neutron capture, which, yeah, don't be frightened. It just means S process, meaning slow, R process, rapid. Then everyone forgets about cosmic ray spallation, how cosmic rays still continue to form elements. And then we'll have some summary and some homework for you to take home. Can't forget the homework. So, okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about the, some background. So the atom, just a little bit refresher. You probably remember this picture from school. The atom essentially consists of a nucleus and there's electrons and sort of, uh, let's just call them orbits for now. Of course, that's a whole can of worms to open up there with 
orbital properties and so on with pr probability waves and stuff. But the bottom line is the central nucleus that's surrounded by electrons. That nucleus is then split up into neutrons, which have no charge, and protons, which have a positive charge, to match these electrons, which you recall are negatively charged. The other fundamental particles in here, yeah, electrons are fundamental particles. Protons and neutrons are not. They're made up of quarks. So the neutron is one up quark and two down quarks. The proton is two up quarks and one down quark. You don't need to get bothered with, too bothered with that. The bottom line is there are fundamental particles called quarks which go to make up these neutron and proton. And you'll see why that's relevant very, very soon. Um, and then there's another fundamental particle called gluons, and they carry the, what they call the strong nu nuclear force, which holds all the quarks and the neutrons and protons together to keep that nucleus whole in, in integrity. And as I've mentioned here, the strong nuclear force, and the key to this, very relevant for what we're about to talk about, short range. Very short range, the strong nuclear force. If something gets a certain distance away, two particles can't feel the force and can't be held together. This just I put in here, just to um, just a nice illustration. So here's a proton made up of three quarks, two ups, one down, and the neutron made up of three quarks, two down, and one up. And there'll be gluons in there, like little virtual particles that come in and out of existence to keep these quarks together and keep the neutrons and protons together. So that's... Um, just a bit of revision of atomic and mass numbers and how you annotate that. So here's a helium atom here. That's the code for helium, H-E. You can see it's got a couple of electrons, but more importantly to, for tonight's discussion is it's got two positively charged protons, and that's called the atomic number. On the, the sort of subscript here on the left-hand side, you'll always see a number. That's called the atomic number, and that reflects the number of protons in a nucleus of an atom. And remember, protons, this whole talk is about protons. Protons is dictates what sort of element you've got. You've got an, a superscript on the left-hand side, and that reflects what they call the mass number. And that reflects the number of neutrons and positrons. So here's your helium, HE. It's got two protons, so it's got a two. Its nucleus has got two protons and two neutrons, so it's got a mass, atomic mass number of four. And that's how you see those things annotated. Just reinforcing what we've already started to introduce, each element has its own proton number, so it follows from that that changing the proton number in an in a atom creates a new element. It follows. It's all about how many protons you've got. That's If there's one message you take out of this place tonight and go home and tell your family if they're still waiting up for you, is your element always dictated by how many protons in the nucleus. Changing neutron numbers creates isotopes. You may have heard of the word isotopes. Think, oh, what does that mean? It just means you're changing the, neutron, the number of neutrons in the nucleus, but not the protons. You change the protons, you've got a different element on your hands. So just want to introduce briefly nuclear fusion, and that refers to the concept of getting two small collections of neutrons and protons, atomic nuclei, bringing them together, merging them to create, a, to create a larger atomic nuclei. And the key thing here is to, is to know is that when you do go through this nuclear fusion process, the atomic mass of the, uh, the initial nuclei that you start off with is always, uh, is, is always greater than your final mass of your final project, product. So in other words, if you totaled up the atomic mass of helium, and a spare neutron, it would be much less than the mass of the deuterium and tritium over here. So it goes through a, fuser, a fu fusion, it gets fused, the mass is left, and the lost mass is released as energy. And we relate this with Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, and that tells us two things. It tells us that mass and energy are interchangeable, and that's all what's happened here. Where's the mass gone? It's been transferred into energy. And the second thing is you can actually calculate the amount of energy that's been released by this formula, m being the mass and astronomical units of the particular um, nuclei. And so, of course, c is the speed of light, which is what eight, sorry, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second, which is a very, very large number. And you square that, and you've got a massive number. So instantly, any sort of small amount of loss of mass here releases because of this equation 
means it's releasing a lot of energy. And it's that energy is what drives stars. This is a bit fairy, but this is the point I put in here. It just illustrates, here's a so you've got two protons, two neutrons, atomic mass of 4.03188 atomic units. You bring them together, look at the, you, then you measure this, and it's only 4.001503 astronomical units. It's a big mass difference, and all you've done is brought them together. It's called binding energy. Energy gets released as you bring these things together. Energy gets released and mass drops, and you can calculate that with Einstein's formula. I wish losing weight was that easy. <coughs> oh, sorry, did I say astronomic? I meant to say atomic. I meant to say atomic, pardon me. <coughs> is that a habit, sorry? Atomic units, AU is atomic. Didn't even realise I'd said that. Thanks, Bill. Yep. yep, atomic units. Okay, now moving on. So we talked about the atom. We talked about the concept of nuclear fusion, bit of, um, a, a bit of revision there. Radioactivity or radioactive decay, there's all sorts of names you can use it. It is an important process in making new elements. And there's three sort of concepts I want to talk about here. Who can define what is radioactivity? You can give me a quick definition. What is radioactivity? Okay, so essentially, it's the emission of high energy, usually strong enough where it can ionize another atom, in other words, bump electrons out of its orbit. Radiation, which can be in the form of a particle flying out of a nucleus or a high-energy photon, which is a light particle, from an unstable nucleus, which is usually a large, because what did I say about that strong nuclear force? Short range. Makes sense. If you start getting a big nucleus, it has trouble holding the nucleus together. It starts sort of losing control of some of those outer ones. So such that the short range, strong nuclear force cannot hold together. So you start getting bigger and bigger nuclei, atomic nuclei. The strong force is starting to lose grip on some of the outer ones. It becomes unstable and it starts to go through a process where it emits high energy radiation as either high energy light or high energy particles. So what is the fundamental force behind radioactivity? Who can tell me? Quick. Yeah, it's the weak nuclear force. There are four fundamental forces of nature. There's the strong one, which we've talked about. Short range involves the gluons that hold the nuclei together. But there's the weak nuclear force, which is obviously is weaker. It's very short range also, and is responsible for radioactivity, the processes that go on, which we will talk about very, very shortly. So it's the weak, because you might say, as this next slide, you'll be saying, well, what's driving that? It's a, f a fundamental force of nature called the weak nuclear force. And the other two, yeah, the electromagnetic force that holds us together and also is responsible for light. And of course, gravity, a friend, our friend gravity, or not always our friend, um, which is a long range, and that's the weakest force to them all. And of course, it, it stretches pretty much indefinitely across the universe, galaxy, uh, the galaxy and so on. That's gravity. So what are the ma three main types of radioactivity? Anyone can give me one or two... Yeah, alpha, beta, gamma, Woof, I like it, yeah. Let's have a look what they are. So there's alpha radiation. Alpha radiation means this nucleus spits out alpha particles. Alpha particles is just a term to describe two protons and two neutrons that are bound together with a strong nuclear force. And it just so happens that's also the nucleus of a helium atom. That's exactly what it is. So a helium atom is often called an alpha particle. That's all an alpha particle refers to. So that, there are forms of radioactivity whereby alpha particles get ejected. And you're about to find out tonight how important alpha particles are. There's a theme that runs through this whole talk. Alpha particles are the building blocks, if you will, of nuclear synthesis. It's used so frequently. So you've got to get a source of these things. So radioactivity is your friend. It's, it's handing you some building blocks. Beta radiation refers to when you've got a nucleus and suddenly you see a high velocity electron zooming out of the nucleus. What was that all about, you might say? Well, that tells you what went on inside is the weak nuclear force allowed a neutron to decay into a proton. And when that happens, an electron gets emitted. And what do you know about protons? They are the essence. that They dictate what sort of element you've got on your hand. So you can immediately study getting the idea of the picture. Suddenly you've got a, a neutron, which is neutral, it's decaying into a proton. 
what are you doing? You're effectively creating a new element. You can see why radioactivity is so important going forward, talking about nuclear synthesis. And then gamma radiation is when a high-energy gamma ray photon you see zipping out of there. The usual cause of that is a nucleus has gone through either alpha radiation or beta radiation, and it's been left in a high-energy excited form of state, and it's dropping itself down into a lower state and emits a gamma ray in the process. So it's usually a clue that you've had some alpha or beta radiation going on. Just uh, now, half-life. So how often does this process occur? If you put a nucleus, you know, let's have a long one. Should we wait for a wait for some radioactivity. It's a very random event on single atom basis, atom by atom basis. You can't predict when it's going to happen. So what scientists do, they tend to use it for a probability in large numbers. Just for argument's sake, they might get a particular element and work out, if I had a million of those atoms all together of that element, how long would it take before I only had half a million left? And then half that again and so on. And that's called half-life. And it's, that's how they get around that whole issue of it being a random event. How do you sort it out? You even out the probabilities. The other thing to mention is the half-life of very, various atomic nuclei is such a wide range, is so variable. You get some nuclei that almost instantaneously, as soon as they're created, they're just so unstable, they just decay instantly, and you get other ones that are relatively stable that probably will decay at some stage, but they haven't so far in the life of the universe, but they probably will. So it's a huge spectrum of how long elements take to reduce half their numbers or for through radio decay. Okay, so that's sort of our bit of background introduction sort of knowledge. Let's move ahead with Big Bang nuclear synthesis. In other words, what atoms were formed and how in those very early times. So this is just a diagram, you've probably seen this numerous times, that essentially the universe formed through a, presumably a quantum fluctuation, shall we say, and it was an infinitely dense, hot state when it started. Slowly it started to expand, it has expanded, it naturally started cooling down, and particles got further and further separated from one another. In the first 100 seconds, it was so dense, so hot, all the particles, there was just too much energy, too much high-powered photons coming around, that it was just a sea or a soup of fundamental particles, namely, in particular for our what we're concerned with, quarks and gluons were just zooming around. They just didn't get half a chance to actually hook up with one another and make any structure. It was just so hot. Between 100 and 300 seconds, the temperature was starting to get low enough whereby the quarks and the gluons could start precipitate or, or freeze out of that big, big mixture and start hooking up together to form protons and neurons and, and, and uh, neutrons. However, so you've got some protons and you've got some neutrons. The quarks and the gluons could do it by this stage. It was cool enough. But they still could not hook up together to form an atomic nuclei. Two, two neutrons couldn't hook up. A proton and a neutron could not hook up. Why? The, t the high energy photons you had floating around in there. And the term for it is called photo disintegration. We get real high energy photons that synergy at two protons or two neutrons or whatever to try and hook up. And instead, a, 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 a light photon just gets in and just pulls them apart. And that's what's going on in the first 100 to 300 seconds. After about sort of 300 seconds, or roughly three minutes to 20 minutes, the temperature had dropped further, and the photon energy had dropped below a particular level of 2.23 mega electron volts, whereby now you could allow yourself some nuclear fusion. In other words, two, two neutrons or two protons. For example, here you've got hydrogen that's deuterium, which is a... Um, a proton and neutron could hook up together. You could get a helium-3, helium-4, so you're getting some helium. That's, as you recall, two neutrons and two protons. Suddenly these could, could start forming. Um, lithium has got three protons in it. Beryllium has got four protons in it. So it's just early stuff, just small stuff starting to happen. But yes, you could start getting effective nuclear fusion occurring at this point because the key to it is the photon energy had dropped and was allowing those things to get on and hook up together. 
but there's still a catch. These sort of temperatures are still pretty low compared with what goes on inside stars. So it's still, the fusion could occur, but the fusion rates were still really, really low. And after 20 minutes, the temperature dropped too low when not even nuclear fusion could happen. So in other words, you've only got a 17-minute window after the Big Bang to get on and create some atomic nuclei. And even then, it was just these early ones with one proton, two protons, three protons, and four protons. And that gives rise to here um, with our lovely periodic table. And you'll see here, here's the Big Bang fusion with the hydrogen, a bit of lithium, helium, um, and the beryllium. They don't put a little bit, uh, just a fragment. There's a bit disputable, but a fragment was made in that space of time. So your end result at the end of 20 minutes after the Big Bang of atomic nuclei, 75% was just hydrogen, which means just a naked proton on its own. 24% helium, which is a proton and a neutron hooked up, and just tr then just trace amounts of li lithium, which is three protons, a bit of deuterium, uh, which is a, a proton and a neutron, and beryllium, which has got three protons. Just trace amount of these ones, and 75% hydrogen and 24% helium. In fact, that is one of the evidence, in fact, you can see in particular this ratio here, the ratio of hydrogen to helium that you see in the universe today, is actually one of the key evidences for the Big Bang, because <coughs> it matches what the, the astrophysicists have worked, particle physicists have worked out. So these elements, of course, remain in what we call a plasma state. In other words, it wasn't cool enough for electrons to be attracted to them just yet. That took another 380,000 years to, of cooling off before the electrons could get associated with atomic nuclei. So it's called a plasma state. But yeah, only 17-minute seven, window to start forming some, just some light, small amounts of atomic nuclei. Okay, so have it stellar nuclear synthesis. In other words, what sort of new elements and atoms are made inside stars? I've broke this down to core, what happens in the core of a star, and then the shell, nuclear fusion going on in low mass stars. So we're going to do that first, core and shell nuclear fusion in low mass stars. Then we're going to move on to capturing neutrons through the S process and AGB stars. AGB, as you'll find out, stands for asymbiotic giant branch stars. It's a, it's a uh, very late phase in the evolution of low to medium mass stars, less than eight solar masses. And then we'll talk about nuclear fusion going on in the core in the shells of high mass stars. So here we go first, core and shell nuclear fusion in low mass stars. First of all, the principle, you probably hear this over and over and you can't hear it enough, that stars spend 90% of their lives in a nice stable position on what we call the main sequence. This is the hirschsprung russell diagram. It's never, ever going to go away as long as I'm giving a talk. <laughs> and here you've got your temperature of your stars here with the luminosity, how bright. And if you get multiple stars, enough stars to start plotting them, luminosity versus temperature, you end up with a diagram that looks like this. 90% of stars sit on this nice big diagonal streak through here called the main sequence. And by definition, what's going on in these stars is you're fusing hydrogen to helium nuclei. And that's generating that energy. Mass gets lost during that process. I saw you in one of those early slides in, in um, atomic units, not astronomical units. You're creating energy, and that's propping up. So you've got the gravity of the star pressing inwards, recreates the high temperature, which then creates nuclear fusion and drives pressure out. And that keeps it in a state of what they call hydrostatic equilibrium. And that's what's going on in here. Now, I toss this in here, a bit of thought. The solar core temperature, so the temperature at the core of our sun, is about 15 million degrees. It's got to try and remember helium, sorry, a hydrogen is just two, it's just rather one hydrogen, it's just one naked positively charged proton. So fusing them, you've got to get these two positively charged protons together, link them up to form Helium, like a magnet, it tends to repel by electrostatic forces. So to get two protons to come together, you need a high temperature, such that they're zipping around really, really quickly, and they actually get rammed together for that strong nuclear force to kick in. The temperature at the centre of our sun is 15 million degrees. That's hot, but it's still not hot enough to drive two protons together to overcome that electrostatic force of two positive things coming together. 
What's the key to that? What's, in, what's play? How do you explain? Well, obviously it does happen. We're here. But, it, but the temperature doesn't explain it. What's the factor that's going on here? Two words. Yeah, quantum tunneling. Absolutely. So quantum mechanics, quantum physics said that that particles, once a particle's travelling in a certain direction, you don't really know where it's going to be next. It's a probability thing. Like if I throw this thing over here, yeah, we all know 99% chance it's going to land right about there somewhere. But there's a small one in a million chance it could end over here or could end over there and so on. So it's just a probability game. Very small probability, but that's what quantum mechanics says, that there's a thing called quantum uh, tunnelling, whereby, so, if you're trying to get over this big sort of uh, hurdle of electrostatic forces trying to bring two protons together and the temperature is not enough to get up that hill, the laws of probability of quantum mechanics come in. And it says, there's just one in a zillion chance maybe that this here might next just suddenly appear over here on the other side of the hill. And indeed, that's what's going on. A bit of quantum tunnelling provides the final little lift to get two protons close enough to one another where that strong nuclear force and the gluons can come in and pull them together. And all the equations match it perfectly. The particle physics and the qu uh, with the quantum physics guys, they estimated how much nuclear fusion should be going on if quantum tunnelling is doing its thing, and it came out bang on. And they did that with counting solar neutrinos with our talk last year on that. So hydrogen fusion to helium in the core of the stars is not totally that simple. It occurs by what two main mechanisms are used to bring two proteins together, protons together to create a helium nuclei. Was that Tony? Yeah, proton, proton chain? Oh, not quite, no. This, it's the proton-proton chain and the CNO cycle are the two mechanisms which stars will use to bring hydrogen nuclei, in other words, just positive charged protons together to create helium nuclei. We're going to look into these. Don't look at, I'm going to show you a little bit of detail. You don't take it on board. Really, the message is that there are two separate mechanisms and they are a little bit involved. There's different pathways. This is the proton-proton chain. And as you can see here, whoa, what's going on here? And all this diagram is saying look, there's actually four different main branches you can go down to start with some um, protons, i.e. hydrogen, to come out with some helium at the end of the day. There's sort of four main pathways. It also tells you that 85% of the pathways use this pathway right here, the branch one. You start off with the protons, you go through a various chain here. That's it here, I don't know if you've probably seen that diagram multiple times. If you do, that's sort of the classic way of the proton-proton chain, which is the predominant one in our sun. It, it goes through, that's the first branch of the proton-proton chain. You can see you start off with four protons, and you end up with a helium nuclei and two protons left over. So all you need to know here is that Yep, there are. It's, it's the proton proton chain is one of the pathways. It's the one predominantly used in our sun. There are four different individual branches, if you will, of that. Um, and the branch one in particular is 85% is of it. But the other thing to take on board look how all these other things. A bit of barium has been produced, a bit of borium, a bit of lithium has been produced, just in tiny, small amounts through going through all these different pathways here. So it's just not a matter of simply getting two protons, sticking them together, make a couple of neutrons, throw them in the mix, and away you go. It's a bit more complicated than that. And the other one is the CNO cycle, whereby you start off with some hydrogen, and yet you end up with helium. But in the process, you've got carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen entering into a series of equations here of chemical processes that go on. And at the end of it, the carbon, the nitrogen, and the oxygen enter as is and leave it as is. I don't know if you remember in chemistry in school, you talk about the catalyst, the definition of a catalyst, something that speeds up a chemical equation or process but comes out unaltered at the end of the day. So you get some hydrogen in there, which is some protons. If you happen to have some carbon, some nitrogen, and some oxygen in the mix as well with really high temperatures, which you'll see shortly, you get all a series of equations going on whereby hydrogen is turned into helium and the carbon, nitrogen and oxygen come out conserved 
as, and they essentially work as catalysts. So that's the other main cycle, and that's got various branches as well, well beyond the scope of this talk. But so the, it's the proton-proton chain, the CNA, CNO cycle are the two main methods stars use to convert hydrogen to helium. They involve multiple different pathways, but, but, but you get the gist of it. Now, so here, this, this diagram is a plot of temperature of stars' cores here amongst energy generation through the proton-proton chain, or the CNO cycle. And you'll see here that as stars get hotter and hotter in their cores, they start utilizing the CNO cycle more and more to generate helium out of their hydrogen. And you'll see here they've got the sun here, one solar masses. And you see here, if you draw a line down there, you'll see the proton proton chain is, much, is by far and large the predominant method that our sun uses to generate helium. You might say, well, at what stage, how many solar masses is this whereby the CNO cycle is actually becoming more predominant? That's about 1.3 solar masses. The CNO cycle starts to get more predominant. So after the main sequence, so that carries on for a few billion years, and then this low mass order, both low mass and high mass stars, they then run out of hydrogen. The temperature in the core goes up and up again. I won't explore the mechanisms for that. That's on stellar evolution. But needless to say, the temperatures get up to 100 million degrees, from 15 million from our sun, so up to 100 million Kelvin. And you start producing from the helium starts fusing to create carbon via the, what they call the triple alpha process. You already know that alpha particle is just another name for helium. You've just learned how helium is building up, is generating more and more of it from hydrogen through the CNO cycle or the proton-proton chain. If I were to say to you, however, that why is a core temperature of 100 million degrees necessary? You think, well, they put two hydrogen together at 15 million for a bit of help, a bit of assistance from quantum tunneling. Well, why do you need 100 million just to bring three alpha particles, a helium nuclei, together? And there's, there's a reason why. Who can tell me? The key to it is beryllium-8, because you, you get two alpha particles, bring them together, create a helium, bring, bring on another helium particle to create the carbon-12. Beryllium-8, we talked about radioactivity and how something could be stable or unstable. It is so unstable, it has a half-life of 3 times 10 to the minus 16 seconds. So 3, or 0 0.00016 times 3 of a second, and beryllium will just pull itself, just rip itself apart through radioactivity. It's very, very unstable. So at 100 degrees Kelvin, you've, you've then got the rate of collision rate is whereby you can bring that third alpha particle in very quickly to latch on and to collide with that beryllium within 3 times 10 to the minus 16 seconds. That's the point why you need such, it's sort of a real barrier, 100 million degrees is necessary. And that brings on the triple alpha process. But that's why once you bring two helium together, you better be moving your alpha particles rather fast. You get another one lined up there and wham into there rather quickly before it just all disintegrates back to square one. But once you are up to 100 million degrees in the core, yes, you can allow this equation to, to proceed and you get your carbon-12. Now, during this process, I put this slide in here. So during the main sequence, hydrogen starts burning away into helium. Helium builds up, and as we know, then helium will start burning too. But just as a thing I want to put in here is that what you've just been burning previously in the core moves out into an outer shell around the core where hydrogen fusion or whatever chemical you happen to be, atom you happen to be dealing with keeps burning. So what you've just burnt in the core moves out to, to a, a thin shell around the core and it keeps burning. And that keeps going in a sequ sequential order, which you'll see shortly. But I just wanted to put that in you. You start getting a shell of hydrogen fusion around the core as helium starts to burn as well. So, so that's what's happening in, shell, and sorry, in the core in the shell nuclear fusion in low mass stars. Let's talk a little bit about neutron capturing in these asymptotic giant branch stars. So this is it here, the hersprung russell diagram of these low mass to medium mass stars. In other words, um, anything up to eight solar masses, a solar mass being the mass of our sun, which is about two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. 
So you've got your main sequence. It's a pre-red giant phase. Then they become red giants. And at this stage, helium is starting to burn in here. Then they f f um, helium starts running out. They come to the stage here. It's called the asymptotic giant branch phase. And that only your stars up to eight solar masses go through this phase. It's a rather interesting time. And it's split into the early and the late phase. So let's go to the early phase first. And at the early phase, the temperatures in the core are hot enough where you get a carbon that you've just made through the triple alpha process. You bring in another helium, another alpha particle. Remember that I said to you, I gave you a warning, those alpha particles generated from various ways through protons coming together, but also through radioactive decay is so important. Everything evolves around these alpha particles. So you're hooking an alpha particle onto a carbon-12 at this stage to create nuclear fusion, release energy, and you're starting to get some oxygen. And we all know, we well should know, because from last month's talk on stellar corpses, that you're creating a white dwarf here with a planetary nebula, ultimately. Your stellar corpse, and what stellar corpses are? White dwarfs leading up, to, you know, for stars up to eight solar masses. They just, it's oxygen and carbon, compact, inert oxygen and carbon. So that's how the oxygen gets there, through this early stage in this asymptotic giant branch stage. So you end up with a hot core of carbon and oxygen at this stage. Now, that's the early stage at, for these stars. In the late stage, something else starts happening. You start getting, in the outer regions of the shell, you're starting to get zones of hydrogen and zones of helium fusion going on. And I think I gave that, I gave a whole talk. You cre it creates, I won't go into the depth, uh, to the details, it creates what they call thermal pulses. I gave a whole talk on thermal pulses last year. So, but needless to say, you get these bands around here of hydrogen fusion and bands of helium fusion just out from the core. They create these thermal pulses where the star pulsates backwards and forwards, and you've probably heard of Seaford variables being used. These guys are Seaford variables. The thermal pulses then start to create some convection currents in all the stellar material out here. You start seeing convection. Slowly, it moves rather slowly, just a bit slowly, the, the stellar material starts nice, nice convection. And in that process, it starts picking up carbon and sometimes some oxygen from the outer core. Remember that core now is, is oxygen and, and carbon? It starts picking some of that up and carrying it through the star and bringing it up to the surface. That process is called dredging or dredge-ups. There's actually three different phases in stars. The first two are when they're red giants. The third stage of dredge-ups occurs at the stage AGB stars. And this takes some years. It doesn't just happen. It's not happening all of a sudden, but slowly over many years, this thermal pulses is creating these convection cells within the stellar material. Bits of carbon and oxygen are slowly working their way up. And that's how you get carbon stars. You've probably heard the expression, carbon stars. It's, that's how the carbon got there. The very sooty atmosphere. There's a lot of soot going on in their atmosphere. That's how it got there, through dredges from, from uh, thermal pulses. But we were heading with all this. Over many years, all this carbon starts working its way through the stellar, ma stellar material. It's no surprise. It just casually, there's a stray neutron, just happens to be casually going past, and the nucleus says, I'll have you, thank you very much, and it grabs it and captures it, and that's hence the name neutron capture. Because it's a slow process in these stars over many, many years, they call it the S process. And the other key to this so it's happening really, really slowly, which means, just check, I've got it here in the main slide, oh, yes I do. If it's happening really, really slowly, it's giving that new neutron that it's got attached onto its nucleus, which is now maybe a little bit less stable, it goes through some, some decay, nuclear decay. In one of those decays, what are the better radiation, what happens? A neutron changes over to a proton, what have you got? You've got a new element on your hands. Just through the process of some convection, bringing some carbon up, just casually bring it through the stellar material. It captures a neutron. The neutron just sits there for a while, plenty of time for better radiation to occur, better decay. Neutron changes to a proton. Hey, new element. That occurs slowly over many years, allowing to further and further decay, more neutron captures and so on. And you get where I'm building up building up bigger and bigger nuclei, nice and slowly, allowing it better to decay to happen, creating newer elements, completely new elements with that proton number. 
I put in here too, um, if it's a heavy, because sometimes you get the heavy nuclear seed in there will catch as a stray one. If it'll hang on to it, more, perhaps sometimes more, in a more stable way, and it can just slowly increase, increase, and you get bigger and bigger isotopes. But now you might say, well, where, how about these, um, you heard somewhere there, there's some iron nuclei, you, you often read about that. You think, where did these come from, that star? It's mainly carbon, but if you've got a, a, you know, a second generation, a third generation star, it's going to have some iron nuclei from previous generations, and they will quite happily build up some much larger nuclei again. You might say, well, where's the, these free nu neutrons that you say are just casually wandering through the star? Where do they come from? There's a couple of reactions that will do them. Your carbon, you get an isotope of carbon, you bring in an alpha particle. These guys are out there. They're so important, these alpha particles, or helium nuclei. They join together. They form oxygen and a spare neutron, which is it just wanders casually through the star. And the same with neon and an alpha particle forms magnesium and neutrons as well. So you can get these things, reactions going on. They create spare neutrons, which then are latched to the carbon and so on. It's just being dredged up from the core. So it doesn't all the action nucleosynthesis is not necessary inside stars in their cores. A lot could happen in the alpha regions, just not nuclear fusion. So this is it. So when you look at this uh, these color-coded periodic table, what's represented by this process? Dying low-mass stars. It's referring to stars up to eight solar masses that are in the asymptotic giant branch. This is just before they go into um, planetary nebula and white dwarfs. And these are these guys here. So you've got a bit of nuclear fusion in the core, but you've got some slow process neutron capturing going on. Here's your carbon, your nitrogen, all these green ones. So it's responsible for half the atomic nuclei heavier than iron is from the process for going on in these stars. I've also talked about in previous talks about the IMF, the initial mass function, which that says the smaller a star is, the more and more there are of them. And that's why you've got such a large you know, representation because there's just more and more of these smaller stars which are doing this process. So that's what the green, the dying low mass stars, when you see that now you think, oh, I know what that means now. So yeah, as I've alluded to, Sol eight solar masses, they can't generate any more force because they're not big enough to generate enough gravity to raise the core temperatures higher. So the core just leaves itself here as oxygen and carbon. It's really inert. A state what they call electron degeneracy, which have a look at the, one of the videos from two months ago. We talk about that. And the outer layers gently blow off over a few thousand years. These are all the outer layers of that asymptotic giant branch phase. And it leaves a, the central white dwarf, carbon and oxygen. These guys are really, really hot, up to about 30,000 degrees Kelvin. So they emit ultraviolet light. And it's the ultraviolet light that ionizes to light up all the material around to create these pretty pictures of planetary nebula. So you might think, oh, that's the end of the story there for those stars, but it's not quite. A lot of those white dwarfs, yep, you've got a lot of carbon and oxygen locked up in there that's never going to see the light of day, sadly. But also, we talked about last month's talk on nova and supernova and different types of supernova. You'll recall that if a white dwarf gets in a close binary system with something like a red giant next to it, it starts siphoning off material from that red dwarf, forms an accretion disk. If it builds up the mass of that white dwarf builds up over 1.4 solar masses, it becomes unstable and it rips itself apart with a massive catastrophic explosion called a type 1A supernovae. And in that explosion, two things are happening. One is the carbon and the oxygen have suddenly been ignited and go through various phases. Not well understood, but a lot of nickel and iron and various other elements get produced and show up in the spectra, including silicon, how you define them. A lot of silicon as well. A lot of these heavy elements show up if you look through a white type 1A supernova explosion. And the other thing I was going to mention, just going back a slide, the purpose course, these um, planetary nebula, all that stuff that we talked about that got processed and created through the S process neutron capture, these planetary nebula are providing a good process in which they're spreading out and getting distributed through the galaxy. And of course, your 1A type supernova is another way of just, it, it's far more dramatically, spreading all the material out that's created in that explosion. So, 
when you look, here we go. They have a little part here. Um, white dwarfs are the close binary can generate one A supernova when the mass exceeds one point solar masses. It's a whole talk which you'll go back over one of the videos from last month and you'll see that. And here it's represented by in silver, exploding white dwarfs. And you can see in a white dwarf, these are all the sort of elements that show up in the spectra that get created in a white dwarf. The, the exact processes that are going on there are not fully understood at the moment. But immediately you can see bet between the silver and the green, there's a lot of elements that have just been created from low mass, low to intermediate mass stars. So let's talk about now stellar nuclear synthesis, what goes on inside stars. But the core and shell nuclear fusion in high mass stars, so stars greater than eight solar masses. And there's two main sort of things that go on. First of all, once again, the alpha process, helium capturing. You get carbon here. You've seen this reaction before. It grabs itself out of helium to create oxygen. Oxygen grabs itself a helium or an alpha particle to create neon. Neon grabs itself one as well. Might as well be in on the party to create magnesium. The alpha process is so important. These alpha particles cannot be overestimated how important they are in nuclear synthesis. And you've seen how they're created through radioactivity. You've seen how they've been created through um, fusion of hydrogen through the proton-proton chain in the CNO cycle. And I'm also going to show you how they are created in large amounts and supernova explosions too through um, some intense photo disintegration. But these, the bottom line is these alpha processes, there's various processes that, that create these alpha particles and they're so crucial in building up heavier and heavier elements. And then there's various other reactions. You can get a carbon and oxygen, drive it towards silicon, two oxygen to create sulfur, two silicons to form some iron. And this whole process goes along in a sequential order as the core temperatures get hotter and hotter and hotter inside these big stars. They're able to drive it more and more and more. And that is a whole talk. So I just really wanted to say that there are sort of two main principles of nuclear fusion going on as the temperature rises in the core of these large mass stars. Until you reach iron. Okay, up till now... I just let's just actually jump. Okay, here's I no, I'm just going to step back a little bit. Okay, until the star is a core of iron, it also has these multiple shells. So here's your little core in here around this big giant red supergiant. Here's the core that's been split up. Remember, we talked about we get little shells, so, uh, surrounding shells, sub subsequently just around here. And it's like you've got hydrogen burning out here, hydrogen fusion in this cell, then helium fusion, carbon fusion, oxygen, and so on, right up to getting silicon fusion causing iron. And this is where the game has another change. Right up to then, each of those nuclear fusion reactions, as you've learned, some masses loss which creates energy, and it's that outpouring of energy in that core from nuclear fusion that holds that star up, that drives this whole process. Suddenly, you get to iron. You try and bring two iron nuclei together, fuse them. This time, because due to a high binding energy involved in bringing and holds iron together, you bring two iron together, instead of releasing energy, it actually absorbs energy. The, the, essentially, the ride stops, the game stops here. It absorbs energy. So what's going to happen? Nuclear fusion instantly stops in the core of this massive star. Nothing's holding it up anymore. It's going to collapse, isn't it? Before we move on to the exact mechanisms, because this is some interesting stuff coming up, I really wanted to put in here, each successive stage of nuclear fusion occurs in shorter and shorter time lengths. And here's your little shells here. For example, for 25 solar mass stars, hydrogen to helium on the main sequence, remember I said that's 90% of a star's life is spent in the stable state. So 7 million years. Helium to carbon, you're talking about 70,000 years. Carbon to oxygen, just 600 years. Oxygen burning to silicon, Whoa, only six months. The silicon burning to form iron all occurs in one day. You can see exponentially the whole process. The temperatures are going up and up and up. The, the fusion rates <coughs> are burning higher and higher until you get this iron, tries to fuse itself, and the core collapses. And the core collapses in quarter of a second. <coughs> hard, to, hard to imagine, really, isn't it? So you get... 
So the massive star's core collapse is quickly followed by a highly energetic supernova explosion. These explosions are so powerful that they outshine their host galaxy. So if you look in a galaxy somewhere away, and you massively see a supernova goes off, you see the supernova just light up far brighter than the entire galaxy you happen to be looking at. They're the most explosive sort of events, so some of the most explosive events in the universe. So what's driving them? What happens? So this naturally leads on to our next chapter, chapter four on explosive nuclear synthesis. How, what and how new elements are formed in the midst of all these explosions. And it starts with the core collapse, supernova, kilonova, and neutron capture. So let's go and have a look. So th with these explosions, what's actually going on in here to create this massive explosion? And there's five main sort of mechanisms that's going on. You know, I was, I remember reading early days about this, and I was just told that, okay, iron couldn't fuse, fusion stopped, the whole star couldn't support itself. It just collapsed. You had this core. It came down to a central core, a very dense, if you're a neutron star or a black hole, and then the rest of the material just rebounded off that. I'll show you right now. There's so much more going on than that, and even that word rebound, there's so much more to say about that to explain these massive explosions. You've got a process. There's five main processes. I'm just going to list them here, and then we'll go through each one in depth. Photo disintegration. You've already had a bit of an introduction to that process to create alpha particles. Compression of protons and electrons. There's going to be a lot of those boys in there. They're going to get compressed to form neutrons and neutrinos. Here's, this, is, this is the fun bit. Compounding rebound effect of core and stellar material we'll talk about. We're going to talk about a massive outward flux of neutrinos. I'll explain neutrinos shortly. And that's going to give rise, as you'll see, to cells of heated, high-velocity stellar material, hot cells all independently traveling up the top, bursting out to create these, these supernova explosions. So let's have a closer look at each of these processes. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> so once again, often you get told, look, fusion stops, so it all goes bang, it explodes, and, that, and that's what's ripping all the particles apart. What's going on really is ripping these ions apart is energetic photons, really powerful high-energy gamma photons. Remember we talked about the early stage of the, of the universe between 100 and 300 seconds. Quarks and gluons were able to, to come together to form protons and neutrons, but there was the, the photons, the light particles, were so powerful, they just instantly just tore protons and neutrons away from one another, photo disintegration. And that's what's going on here. Highly energetic particles also see these ion nuclei just sitting there, and instantly they're also just racing into them, just ripping them apart, creating the, all these multiple alpha particles. And you get where I'm heading with these. You know that this process is about to be spread right across the galaxy. So that's another method at which you create large number of alpha particles through this pro process. And I love this little comment here. Photo disintegration in a core collapse supernova undoes hundreds of thousands of years of nuclear fusion by splitting the iron nuclei into the helium nuclei and neutrons yeah, in a quarter of a second. So it doesn't, in a split second, you're just undoing hundreds of thousands of years of nuclear fusion. So it just creates a dense soup of helium nuclei and neutrons. The next thing to mention when all this is collapsing, the forces are so great, you've got lots of protons and neutrons and electrons all in the mix. The forces are jamming protons and electrons together, and when you do that, a proton and electron jam together, you create a neutron and what they call a neutrino. A neutrino is a tiny little uh, particle that's neutrally charged, and if, I know if you remember from a talk last year on solar neutrinos, they're quite ghostly particles. They don't interact because they're neutral, they're tiny. To really to interact with something, they've got to go head on with the nucleus of another atom, which does not normally happen very often. And it's been a real problem for them. But suddenly you've got one neutrino that's produced for every proton to neutron. And trust me, there are zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of this whole protons and electrons being jammed together. So you're creating large, large numbers of neutrinos, and that's very relevant. Neutrinos carry most of the energy away out from the supernova. So hold that thought. Now, here's 
when we have a little demonstration. So yeah, you're always, you know, you often sort of, you, I've only the early days, get my head around it all. Okay, so the core collapses down like that, yep, into a neutron star, say. I get that, and all the stellar material starts, you know, coll you know, rushing inwards, the big vacuum that's been created, hits the core, the solid core, and rebounds off again, and causes this big supernova explosure. No, it's, it's, it's far more exciting than that. What's actually going on, and it's a big difference, this is important, but I'm going to demonstrate it shortly. What's going on is your core, sure, it collapses, but it also rebounds off itself. And it does that at exactly the same time that all the stellar, outer stellar material is just rushing inwards, and all happening at the same time, such that the stellar material is not rebounding off a static core, dense core, just sitting like that. It's actually rebounding off a rebounding core, collapsed core. And you might say, well, that's interesting. Tell me something exciting, would you? I'll show you something exciting. I'll show you what that means. Okay, so let this ball basketball here represent the core that's collapsed and it's rebounding. And intuition tells you it's only going to bounce so high. It's not going to come back up to my, the height of my hand. Yeah. So that's the core doing its little rebound after it's been compressed down. This tennis ball, just for logistics, I've made it smaller because it's going to sit on top of there. But this represents the stellar material all rushing in to strike up against the surface of this compressed, collapsed core to rebound. And once again, it only bounces so high. Now... Everyone run for cover, watch out for light for things. You watch this, when the two go together, and the outer one rebounds of something else that's rebounding itself. <laughs> look at that. I'll give it another go and see if I can hit the seal, but it just ricochets off. It's, it's, look at the energy from that to this. Let's do it like this. Yeah, and, and usually if you get it straight up, it just goes wham. I've, I've already almost taken out a few light fittings at home while I'm trying to do that one anyway, but yeah, it's quite cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've got to do that one more time. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Whoa, third time lucky. <laughs> Yeehaw. Yeah, so look at the difference. Just, it, was, it was only because this ball was rebounding off something else that was also rebounding. Amplification, compounding. It's just, look at the difference. And that is the key. Just take away, if there's one thing you go home and tell your family, it's not a matter of all the material just coming in and hitting the inert, dense core rebounding out. It's rebounding off something else that's rebounding itself. Look at the difference. Go home and try it. Take out some light fittings. <laughs> oh, God, I get excited. Isn't that so exciting? So you can see, suddenly there's a lot more going on in supernova than you often hear or learn about. <clears throat> so let's move on. Oh, I've got to calm down after that. Whew. So the other thing is you've got this outpouring of these neutrinos, these ghostly little things. And you might say, well, didn't you say that they are rather ghostly? They don't collide very well? Well, there's two factors here. One is, yes, it's only a small fraction of them that will strike atomic nuclei that are coming in from this collapsing stellar material, but you've started out with such a huge, huge, huge astronomical number of neutrinos, such that a small fraction is still a large number. So you've got massive numbers of these tiny wee particles called neutrinos heading outwards, and these collide and start breaking apart all the stellar material that's heading inwards, and further turns around and starts driving everything out. So yeah, the, the, um, the other thing is the stellar material. Of course, you're dealing with very dense stellar material that's coming forward you. So there's a lot of atomic nuclei for these neutrinos to wham into as well. So the bottom line is that's a very significant effect that these neutrinos are heading out also into that stellar material and heating it up and breaking apart the stellar material. And what that does do, it creates little cells of high-velocity outward stellar material. So the stellar material just doesn't totally rebound and just head back out again. The neutrinos heats it up further and gives it even more energy because neutrinos 
travel very close to the speed of light. So they're really getting in there, colliding and heating, and they form like these little bubbles, if you will, of stellar material. So it's not all orderly stellar material going out. They, they're in getting heated up into form little sort of bubbles or cells, and out they go. And if you had some sort of strange way to look at a supernova, that's sort of an artist's impression of what it would actually look like. So, yeah, so the, the bottom line is, after all that excitement, kind of calm down, the high-energy explosion of the, all this heated material that's rich in atomic nuclei and rich in neutrons, because remember, you've just rammed a whole stack of protons and to ram them with electrons, and you've created more neutrons. You've got an environment that's rich in neutrons, rich in atomic nuclei. It, it's, it's high energy, it's heated material, it's just a fertile ground for just bringing people, you know, bringing particles together and creating heavier nuclei and new elements. And indeed, they call that, it's, uh, through the process of neutron capturing, grabbing neutrons, because it's happening so much quicker or rapidly, it's called the R process. So when you see the word R process neutron capture, don't think it's, it's nothing crazy. It just means, yeah, it's atomic nuclei. They're rather quickly, everything's happening at a very fast pace. They're capturing neutrons, building up on the atomic nuclei, and it's happening rapid, so they call it the R process. Now, the key, the, the key to this one, remember in these AGB stars, it was a slow process, so you had time to capture a neutron, wait until it decays to a proton through better decay to build up to another nuclide, grab another neutron and build up that way. This is the opposite. It builds up so quickly, up to a 1,000 collisions with neutron capturing per second, whereby it can quickly grab another neutron, grab another neutron before better decay can set in, which means that you can, a lot quicker, build up bigger and bigger isotopes by grabbing more neutrons, more and more, create some really big heavy nuclei, thank you very much, which then some better decay can do its thing and create new, new, um, new uh, atoms and such. So this process is for a lot of new heavy large elements are formed through this process because it captures neutrons really, really quickly before they decay. And here it is, high energy explosions, Heated material rich in stellar atomic nuclei neutrons provide a fertile ground, as we spoke. And it's these conditions here, explosive mass of stars that's in yellow, and it's responsible for half the atomic nuclei heavier than iron. So where's your iron in there? Here it is. So it's responsible uh, for half the atomic nuclei. Yeah, so it's, it's these, the um, atomic, here it is, the supernova here. You can see it's responsible for all these ones here. We've already talked about the green ones, we've talked about the silver ones, we've talked about the Big Bang, so we're almost there talking about how all these elements form. What we haven't done yet, yeah, in purple. So merging neutron stars made the news a lot um, a few years ago in 2015 when they, with the gravitational waves, where you get two neutron stars, obviously con densely compact stellar corpses full of neutrons, and if they collide, once again, a fertile environment for the R process neutron capture, because you've got an explosive event going on, you've got, it's rich in neutrons, so you get the R process going on there, and it's an all, indeed, all these purple ones here are from neutron uh, mergers. All the heavy elements, including gold, silver, all the things we like, that one there. Purple haze, who wrote purple haze? Jimi Hendrix, yeah. I couldn't help myself when I was writing the colours in there. So there you go, and that's your merging neutron stars. And it's because it's a rich, fertile, explosive ground, rich in high energy and rich in neutrons. So the final one, yep, is cosmic ray spallation. And that's a process where you get cosmic rays, charged particles, travelling at close to the speed of light. They're usually, most of the time, the protons, which is a hydrogen nuclei. And they impact with all this, you know, material, they just strike material, interstellar material, which is usually carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen nuclei that are just floating around out in space in the interstellar material. And they collide with it. And from there, these equations, as examples, you can create boron and you can create beryllium. And you can also create a little bit of lithium and trace amounts of helium-3 are also. So that's just through a process that often just gets dropped off the list, gets forgotten about. But yep, it's happening all the time. Protons traveling through space, close to the speed of light. Where do they come from? Probably from uh, supernova explosions. These protons are heading out. They strike carbon or nitrogen oxygen nuclei in the interstellar medium, 
and you get borium and beryllium and a bit of lithium as well. So, and here they are here, cosmic ray fission, and that's it there. You got your boron, a bit of beryllium, and a little bit of lithium. Gets left off. So, summary. Nuclear synthesis summary. So we've talked about the background, the atom. It was the nucleus we were concerned about or interested in tonight. Nuclear, you start bringing these guys together to make bigger, <coughs> bigger nuclei. You get a drop in mass, and that gets released as energy. Radioactivity, where you get unstable nuclei, whereby the weak nuclear force starts spitting out an alpha particle or starts decaying a neutron into a proton. Very important process. That's, how, that's called nuclear decay. The, shortly after the Big Bang, you had your hydrogen, hydrogen about 75%, helium about 24%, and traces of amounts of lithium and, and uh, beryllium, and a little bit of deuterium. Stellar nuclear synthesis, the, the, the making of new elements inside stars, goes through by nuclear fusion, usually in the core, where the high temperatures are, and in the outer uh, parts, in those low mass stars, you get that slow process neutron capture, by gathering neutrons slowly and allowing them to decay into protons. <coughs> and then during explosive events, supernova and kilonovae, <coughs> because you've got loads of subatomic particles flying around high velocity, very quickly through the rapid process, you're able to capture um, neutrons and build up high nuclei, high mass nuclei, very quickly um, be before they've got time to decay. And then cosmic ray spallation, the cosmic rays, protons traveling out there creates um, a, a some of the uh, light elements. From there, you can do a color-coded periodic table to reflect the origins of the elements, which is yay, which you've seen a few times. So there's some homework. Pick six objects around the house tonight or tomorrow, including your pet, jewelry, car, dinner, etc. Determine roughly what their main constituents are and work out what processes are responsible. <coughs> If you've still got any more friends or family, see, anyone still wants to talk to you, <laughs> get yourself a basketball and a tennis ball and take out some, some, take out some light fittings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you tell your friends at the pub. So, yeah, that's pretty cool, the thing, isn't it? And, and that's the whole... It was just it was something rebounding or something else that was rebounding. So you could demonstrate that quite easily. So nuclear synthesis, the making of new elements, how and where the elements are made. Hope you've enjoyed it tonight. Thank you. Um, cool, so he now has his master's degree. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bill. <laughs> Didn't have it aced it, but yeah, it was all good, good fun. Good fun. Uh, any questions around sort of nuclear synthesis? Yeah, at the back there. Yeah. Correct, and, and hence what they have done here deliberately. Like, for example, you probably is just a small amount here from exploding white dwarfs from 1A supernova and so on. So, yes, they have done that proportionally. The proportional contributions, yep, good question. Yep, absolutely. Yes, Lara. <laughs> I think that my understanding is now, now TC, who can tell me? Technetium. Technetium actually can be made in nature, but it's really unstable, where well, you don't really see it in most of that, but essentially all this is man-made here. And I noticed they've got a shading going on here. Human synthesis, no stable isotopes, I was going to say, because that nature can produce that, but it's got no stable isotopes, they, but you can create it in the laboratory. And, uh, the 
I think it, it all comes down to how, how stable they are, like everything. See, now, I couldn't answer that question. I couldn't, for example, I couldn't give you a talk on man-made elements and their, and their relative half-lives. Some are really, really short half-lives. As soon as they're made, they pretty much pull themselves apart. Some are more stable. Um, that's probably not my field, but I know where you're heading. You, know, you sort of tell us a little bit more about those man-made things. Um, I think they vary a lot, but I'm probably not qualified to... I think it, there are limits and to the point of you starting getting really unstable. The bigger something is, that strong nuclear force, short range, has more and more difficulties. It's like a sheep full of paddocks. The bigger that big... Oh, a, a, a paddock full of sheep. I'm getting... I'm, I'm spent. I've been too excited of the bull. A paddock full of sheep. You know, if, you, if that big herd of sheep's too much, you start losing track of those, otherwise you can't keep track of them all. They start wandering off. This is a smaller flock. And I suppose a flock's a good word to use to describe all those... Protons and neutrons being held together by the, the strong nuclear sh force. It's like holding a flock together. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, oh. uh, more on the an odd one out there. What do they put? Why doesn't it have a little bit of dying low mass star or a little bit of floating mass star? My understanding, most bor boron is, is not that stable and it mostly is from um, cosmic ray spallation. I think I have some seen equations where boron is in some of the equations in stars, but it really, there's not much to, it doesn't really survive. Yeah, it's really fast with yeah. other things yeah. besides stellar cores. Mm. So, I think it's something else. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So you don't, yeah. Yeah. and as opposed to the cosmic spallation, you're out in the interstellar medium, you know, it's the low density stuff, so you get a proton that hits a carbon or something and, a, and, a, and the boron gets created and it's allowed to hang around. It's, it, it, it doesn't react with anything, there's nothing else for it to really react with, it's low density environment. Yeah, Andrew, yeah. Yeah, they actually found evidence of meteorite, but most of that was a half-life of 160 days. And this meteorite comes from the origin of the solar system, so the trace amounts of even the extremely heavy elements right up to the Yep, and that raises all sorts of interesting questions, of course, is... Uh, <laughs> Yep. Of course, we know there was at least a neutron-neutron merger beforehand, of gold and silver and so on. Um, but of course, that could have been a previous generation again. But the key to it was that short half-life, which sort of says, you know, yeah. Are we a couple of questions from the internet. Oh, really? Oh, I'm getting nervous. Yep. Yeah. Well, two questions from one person. But um, repeat the ball. Do they want to see the demonstration again? <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one is... Could you repeat that question? That's interesting. How much does each form of nuclear synthesis contribute oh. to the production of ultra heavy nuclei? Now, ultra heavy, what heavy, what do they mean by that? Because you can see here the main contribution. Your, um, your d low dying, there's, here's your very heavy ones here, your dying low mass stars, and also your um, merging neutron stars, which really creates the quite heavy ones through the R process, neutron capturing. So I would probably say is the merging neutron stars and, and some from dying low mass stars through the slow process, which is all neutron capturing. I think, does that answer the question? It's, yeah, so the ultra heavy ones are all down here and looking at them, notwithstanding these man-made efforts here, but it's, it's mainly, my eyes just see a domination of uh, purple haze and green going on here. So I would say it's neutron capturing through the R process through merging neutron stars and slow ne uh, process neutron capturing through um, s material move, carbon moving up through the interiors of the um, asymptotic giant branch stars. That's a good segue to the other question from the same person, which says, both the R process and the S process of stellar nuclear synthesis rely on absorbing one S or more R neutrons. Where do they come from? Well, the, the neutrons in the slow process, I think we've got up here, comes from a couple of reactions. Let's go back through here. Where were we? There was magnesium involved. There, there are equations we did talk about that here. 
Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, because it was down through here, wasn't it? The source, oh, here it is. Carbon and alpha particles form oxygen and neutrons, and neon with an alpha particle forms magnesium and free neutrons. So there's, those are probably the two main sources of neutrons for the S process in AGB stars. And for the R process, the source of neutrons is just the fact that uh, it's a rich environment. You've got a neutron star that's just packed full of neutrons. You've got protons and electrons being rammed together. So, that, that, so what's not a neutron's neutron will soon become a neutron as the protons and electrons get rammed together. So the whole environment's explosive and it's just rich in neutrons. So you don't need any other source than that, really. So I hope that, does that sort of seem to ask that question? I think so, and the... Um the person clarified that uh, he was thinking of the elements greater than iron, so you're right. right in the first question. Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yep, that's good. Good question. I think there was a question over here too. Yeah. Silly question. No question for silly. In that periodic table we've been looking at, uh, there are two rows at the bottom that appear to be taken out of sequence. Yes. What's the reason for that? Here, these, these ultra heavy ones down here. I think because they have more. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they have more pr properties in here. Neutron Let's call. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can see here, like, e exactly. You can see the line here. They've just extended out here, and th this because all these ones have the same electron configurations, so hence the same chemical properties, and that's how the. Uh, periodic table is, is, dis, is organized and to do with electron configurations and hence chemical properties. And that's just, yeah, it's, to, it's, it's just trying to fit everything in the table. Otherwise, are we all good? Okay, everyone. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's, um, beryllium just is unstable. Um, I couldn't tell the depth of the... Re it's probably the configuration, the level of uh, just the arrangements of the neutrons. A lot of it comes down to also the nuclei, not only how many neutrons and protons you've got, it comes down to the specific arrangements. When you get four neutrons and four protons, they arrange themselves in such a way that they're just in an unstable configuration. Yeah, like I said, yeah, th three to 10 to the minus 16 seconds. Pretty short life, all right? And that's why you've got to have 100 million degrees. to. You've rammed two alpha particles together, create the beryllium, and you've only got three times 10 to the minus 16th of a second to quickly grab another alpha particle and just ram into it to create that carbon. And that's why you need those high temperatures, because it is so unstable. Yep. Yes, yes, yep. Yes, yes, of course, because you're brilliant on Earth, but yeah, within the context. If you're quick enough to get to it, be within three times ten. Mm. Yes, we do. So we're talking about the environment inside the inside the conditions of stars. Yep. Yeah, and they're often within compounds too. They're often in compounds, but yeah, we're talking within the conditions of stellar nuclear synthesis inside stars. Yep. But you're right. You know, these elements are here on Earth, but. Um, yeah, it's part of something else, yeah. Yep. So it's a fascinating topic, yeah. Otherwise, are we all good? Right? Oh, yeah. Karaoke night. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, we're in the heart of Mapariki, so uh, we have a few more events this season. So this Saturday, uh, there's another event at Smiles Farm in the evening from 6 to 8. 
it's part of, they have a star trail there where they've got the story of Matariki uh, with a bunch of different stars around um, Smales Farm in, in Takapuna. Uh, and on a Wednesday night of the 15th of July, uh, there's a, an outreach event at Hobsonville Point. So if you live at Hobsonville Point Way or you're interested in coming along, please do. That's um, at the Sergeant Hall, if you know that area, um, from 7 p.m. And uh, one event that's probably happening on the morning of the 15th of July uh, at 6.30 is up at uh, the Michael Joseph Savage Memorial at Bastion Point. So if you're interested in any of those, uh, see me now or send an email to events at astronomy.org.nz. Thank you. We're all good. All right, good people. Now, um, I think next, uh, next month, introduction to astronomy. I've just had a bit of a time, stressful time leading up between working amongst COVID and, and all my studies and thesis and what have you for Swinburne. So I'm having a break for a couple of months, just have a breather. Peter Fellhoff is talking about uh, time and calendars and dates and so on next month. And the introduction to astronomy in September will be our good friend there, Jonathan Park, who's come up all the way from Hamilton today to be with us. So uh, uh, Jonathan's going to talk on dark energy in September. So that should be good too. And, and uh, Otherwise, uh, be safe, drive home carefully, and have fun with those bulls when you get home. <laughs> all right, thank you. Good night.